If you've spent any amount of time debating the merits of socialism versus capitalism, you've almost certainly witnessed this kind of argumentative move before. Look, socialism has never worked. Every time it's been tried, in Soviet Russia, in Venezuela, and so on, it's led to widespread poverty and the centralization of power and wealth into the hands of an elite few. Yeah, but that's not real socialism. Real socialism is incompatible with the kind of authoritarian dictatorships we've seen in so-called socialist countries. Now, it's not just socialists and socialist sympathizers who make this sort of move. Capitalists and capitalist sympathizers do it too. Free market capitalism never works. It just leads to radical economic inequality where wealth is amassed to a select few private individuals or corporations. And those who have all the wealth and capital can and do influence the system in their favor, either by exploiting workers or by colluding with the government to further their own interests. Yeah, but that's not real free market capitalism. That's cronyism or corporatism, both of which true free market capitalists reject. To people on both sides of this debate, these moves can feel like dodges. And in one sense, they are. They're both ways of changing the subject from the typical practical consequences of implementing a particular economic system to the canonical definition of that system, that system considered as a doctrine. Now, it's understandable why someone trying to defend a particular economic system would want to make this sort of slide. They want to distinguish historical perversions of their favorite economic system from the genuine article. Nevertheless, this sort of pivot has a way of undermining clear thinking about this subject. Let me explain how. First, deploying this move inconsistently, which many people seem to do, creates clear double standards. You can easily find socialists who reject capitalism based on its common practical outworking, all the while refusing to consider the same sort of objections to socialism. In other words, they accept socialism based on its canonical definition, ignoring its common practical consequences, all the while rejecting capitalism based on its common practical consequences, ignoring its canonical definition. Likewise, you can find capitalists who fall prey to the exact same sort of inconsistency. They accept capitalism based on its canonical definition, ignoring its common practical consequences, all the while rejecting socialism based on its common practical consequences, ignoring its canonical definition. Now, I probably don't have to say it, I think you can see it, that just isn't consistent. The standard for acceptance or rejection should be the same for capitalism and socialism. Second, this sort of move can prevent us from seeing the potential causal connections between an economic system and what happens when that system is implemented in the real world. While it's certainly true that there's a distinction between an economic system considered as a doctrine and what happens when that system is implemented in the real world, it may also be true that there are important causal connections between the two. Pivoting to the original doctrine as a way to block objections based on practical consequences has a way of obscuring this possibility. One way to see this is to note that an economic system usually has two components, a stated goal and a proposed mechanism or method to achieve that goal. And it just may turn out that the proposed mechanism or method just doesn't typically lead to that goal. So while socialism in practice may not be real socialism because it's failed to achieve its stated goal, it may well still be an example of socialist mechanisms or methods at work. The same goes for capitalism and its stated methods and mechanisms for achieving its goal. To be clear, I'm not actually taking a position on whether genuine socialist mechanisms or genuine free market mechanisms actually fail to achieve the respective goals of each system. Obviously, determining whether the historical examples we've seen are examples of real socialist mechanisms or real free market mechanisms can help us figure this out. Pivoting back to the stated goals of economic systems does nothing to undermine objections based on what happens when you implement the proposed mechanisms and methods of those systems. So when we debate socialism versus free market capitalism, or any more moderate position in between those two extremes, let's be sure to not only use the right distinctions, but to use them correctly and consistently. Until next time, see ya!